All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Lord, may I hear and receive your word today. Our text this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 17. And we're looking at verses 10 through 14 this morning. We are in the midst of studying Paul's second missionary journey, which is recorded in five chapters in the middle of this book of Acts. He has crossed the Aegean Sea. He has gone to Philippi, where he preached the gospel, if you remember. He was beaten and imprisoned there, and a church was founded there. He is then run out of Philippi, and he goes to Thessalonica where he goes into the synagogue, preaches the gospel again, and the church is established there. And as usual, the Jews cause a riot. In that fifth verse in the 17th chapter we read, <clears throat> but the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. Coming upon the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. So we find that the believers sent Paul away. Sent Paul away by night. The tenth verse. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Paul and his company, his team, they proceeded over land and they make their way southwest from uh, uh, Thessalonica for a distance of about 50 miles to a small city off the path called Berea. Now Berea is described by Cicero, the historian, as an out-of-the-way town. By that he means it wasn't located on the sea or on the major highway. The city is located on the eastern side of Mount Olympus, the birthplace of Alexander the Great. It had a community made up of Jews and Gentiles and Orientals, and they had a synagogue there. And the picture that Luke paints for us is this Jewish community, this Jewish community, one that is steeped in Judaism at its best. If you want to see Judaism at its best working in a synagogue, then we look at the church here at Berea. In other words, we see a picture of the way God had intended from the Old Testament up until the time of Paul's preaching here, how he intended his people to be regarding Judaism. Look at verse number 11. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Now, Luke seems to want to view Berea in contrast to the city that we studied last week, Thessalonica. Rather than compare them, he wants us to notice the contrast, not compare them. And now one of the contrasts that can be seen is that Thessalonica was a large city, a major seaport city. Berea is small, it's a small city. There's another contrast in the way they responded to the word. The way that they responded to the word of God. Notice that the text says these men were more, I want you to see more noble-minded. Noble-minded. And the word, uh, it comes from the Greek word eugenis, which we get our English word eugenics. The word means well-born or high-born. In Luke 19, verse 12, the word is translated nobleman. In the Greek and biblical understanding, 
this was meant to be of noble birth. But it really refers to noble character. And it's certainly used in this case as being of noble character. Now, to understand the Bereans' noble character, we have to remember what we saw at the beginning of Acts chapter 17. What do we learn about the Thessalonians? It is in contrast with the Thessalonians that verse number 11 praises the noble character of the Bereans as they receive the word with great eagerness. Now they were unlike the Jews that we saw the Thessalonians. The Bereans did not doubt or did they resist the message and they did not persecute the preachers. They didn't give them a hard time. Now up until this time, everywhere Paul and Silas went, the audience, the community ended up giving them a hard time. In many cases, they ended up persecuting them. So he's not going to experience this in Berea by these individuals. The Bereans, we are told, were noble in their character. Not because they were suspicious, not because they were hard to be convinced, but because they were teachable and they were receptive to the gospel. These noble-minded Jews of Berea, they were looking for the Messiah. And they didn't need to be convinced of anything other than the fact that Jesus was the promised Messiah. These Jews, we are told, received the word with great eagerness. They obviously loved the Word of God and sought to live by the Word of God. And it was a maximum among the Jews that none was as of noble spirit as these were. They were students of the Old Testament. They were students of the law. Paul seemed to have to work hard to convince the Thessalonians, the Jews, that Jesus was the Messiah. And Luke speaks of Paul's ministry there. Remember the three verbs that we used, we read last week regarding the Thessalonians? He what? He reasoned with them. He had to explain to them. And he had to give evidence. Paul worked real hard with these Thessalonians to show them that Jesus was the Messiah. Those who believe as having been persuaded, the text says, as we closed out last, last, last week's lesson, they were persuaded. Well, the same effort is not seen in Berea. The Greek word translated in this text, received, means to receive by deliberate and readily acceptance of what is offered. When we study this word received in this text, it connotes one who has a favorable reception of the testimony and the teachings. In other words, these individuals thought about the word often. They meditated on the word often. And they were open to embrace the truths that was coming from the word. Luke writes, they received the word with great Eagerness. They received it with great eagerness. Receiving the word then and receiving the word now means a willingness and an eagerness to hear what God has to say on any given topic. We see the same word used in James chapter 1 and verse 21. I want you to see this. James chapter 1 verse 21 says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness, and all that remains wicked in humility receive the word what? Implanted, which is able to what? Save your soul. Which is able to save your soul. Now, this verse gives us the real theme of the, God, of, of the book of the epistle of James. To save your soul. Let's look at this phrase for a minute. In the Greek we have the wording... And it's a normal way of saying to save your life. 
It's not really meaning to save your soul. It means to save your life. There is no text in the Greek Bible where it can be shown to have the meaning to save one's soul from damnation. So James is really talking about the saving of one's life. He's been talking in the verses prior to this one. He's been talking about the death that comes as a consequence of sin. That has been his subject when he says in verse 13 of James chapter 1, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. That is, God does not tempt anyone. But each one is what? Tempted how? When he is what? Carried away and what? Enticed how? By his own lust. Now, now make sure you see the sequence of temptation. Verse 14 says, but each one is what? Tempted when? When he is carried away how? And enticed by his own lust. Look at the results in verse 15. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to what? Sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Now, I don't think James here is referring to spiritual death. Because that was the result of the fall. I think it's best to see that he is referring to physical death or death of relationships or death of situations of some kind. In James 1 and 21, he suggests that the antidote to that kind of consequence is simply living a life that is compatible to the Word of God. Remember, J James is a Jewish epistle, and in the First Testament, the theme is frequently repeated, righteousness leads to life. As we further read in James chapter 1, verse 21, therefore, he says, putting aside what? All filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Read on with me. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. Once again, we can... We can uh, um, um, substitute save your soul or save your life. Verse 22, read with me. But prove yourself what? Doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. What is James saying? James is saying here that they will be saved, their lives will be saved from the destruction that sin brings if they are what? Doers of the word. And all of this starts by, first of all, receiving the word. And receiving the word has to be done as these Bereans, receiving it with e eagerness, is receiving it with a certain kind of attitude. The being doers of the word begins when you first receive the word properly. So this is what he's talking about in our text, receiving the word properly which will enable them to be effective doers of the word. Although the Bereans were eager to hear from God, they were not foolish or gullible people. Their attitude was, you have brought us the message, and the message is good. Now, let us examine from the scriptures and see if your message is true. Now, I want us to kind of pretend like we are sitting in the congregation with the Bereans on a, on a, on a Sabbath and uh, they have the word spoken and um, the stranger comes into the synagogue. Now you remember in the Jewish synagogue, what's the order, what's the pattern of this service? They have prayer and they read scripture. They're going to have about seven men come and read scripture and the scripture is going to come from where? The Old Testament. What part of the Old Testament? The law and the prophets. And you're going to have seven individuals who are going to come and read from these scriptures. And then they're going to do some praying and some more reading. And then they will know that someone is sitting in the visiting section. And sitting in the visiting section indicated to the leading elder of that synagogue that this individual has something to say. 
And Paul would go into the synagogue and he would sit in the visiting <laughs> section to let the leaders know, I have something to say. And when they had got through reading uh, scripture and praying, they would then ask if Paul had something to say. And Paul would begin by talking about the Old Testament, how the Messiah was promised to come, and he would no doubt refer to one of the scriptures that they had already uh, uh, read, and he would point out and lay the life of Jesus right alongside of uh, what the scripture, what the scripture had already indicated, proving that Jesus was the Messiah. And the, so the text is saying, as this congregation is listening, they were soaking it all up. They were they were gravitating it, gravitating to it. They was excited about it. And then Paul would sit down, and they would be just so elated that the scriptures was unfolding. But it wouldn't stop there for them. The service would be over, and they would go home. And the first place that they would go would be to their local, we would call religious library where they would have scrolls of scripture. And they would begin to search to find out again if Paul was correct. And you got to remember, now they didn't bring Bibles to the synagogue. Their word was written on big scrolls. Big scrolls. And so you couldn't carry those scrolls. Everybody didn't have a scroll for themselves. The scrolls were kept in one location, in a single location and they would go to that place where the scrolls were kept and they would begin to search out diligently whether or not what Paul had said was true. Luke describes them as examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Notice this word examining. It means to investigate. The word in use is the New Testament term of judicial investigation. We see another example of this in the Gospel of Luke chapter 23, verse 13 and 14, in referencing to Jesus. Um, once again, Luke, the author, he says, And Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people, and said to them, you brought me this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him, here's our word, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you have made against him. Pilate judicially investigated the charges, and he found Jesus innocent. The scriptures which the Bereans were investigating so diligently were the Hebrew scriptures. They were searching the Old Testament. They were searching to prove that Paul's preaching was correct. Not trying to discredit him, not trying to prove that he was wrong, but trying to make sure that what Paul was saying was true. What Paul said about Jesus didn't harmonize with the Old Testament. Did it agree with the Old Testament predictions? The Bereans wanted to make sure that what Paul was preaching was indeed the truth of God's word. So what did they do? They didn't wait after the synagogue meeting to ask, bombard Paul with a whole bunch of questions. They went and examined the scriptures for themselves. Now notice the text. It says that they examined how? Daily. Daily. Oh, come on, come on. I got a few. I got more than two people reading scripture with me today. They examine the scriptures how? Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about how we, I'm not talking about how we read. I ain't trying to throw off on us, but just, but at, at least acknowledge what your scriptures say, okay? They examine how? Daily. Now, I believe that we need to follow this example. I believe that as believers, we need to follow the example of these Bereans, and we need to search the scriptures daily. We are bombarded on a moment-by-moment -moment basis of what individuals are telling us what scripture says. That's right. You turn on television, Christian television, Christian radio, there are there are myriads of individuals who want to give us their opinion of what the Bible says. And for many of us, we simply take what they say as being the word of God. And then we go many and follow their instructions to only experience 
experience failure. Now think about this. These Bereans are being taught by the most famous apostle in the New Testament. No doubt the most famous theologian of the early church. We know that he at least authored 13 New Testament books. Many of them, no doubt, had heard about the Holy Spirit using him to cast out that python spirit in, in Philippi. Mm -hmm. They had heard about him being put in prison, mm -hmm. and they were singing and praising God at midnight, and the jail's door swung open. They heard. They heard about Truly, surely, God got to be with this man. Mm -hmm. now, 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 no doubt if we heard about somebody of that caliber, Many of us would take his word as gold. Mm -hmm. Yes, we would, Deacon Matt. If he just said it, it got to be it. But these individuals, they had heard of Paul, and they had heard of the miracles, they heard him preach, but they yet studied the scriptures for themselves. They searched the scriptures whenever Paul taught to see if he was teaching biblical. They were not going to simply accept Paul's word as face value. They wanted to know for themselves. They wanted to have a witness, an intrinsic witness within their spirit that what he is saying is true. It's true. They wanted to be able to know the difference between heretical teaching and teaching and doctrine that was true. Paul talks about him being a suffering Messiah. We remember what was the mindset of the common Jews? Well, the mindset of the common religious Jews is that the Messiah wouldn't suffer. They could not imagine a suffering Messiah. Their Messiah was going to be a Messiah who was going to be victorious. Their Messiah was going to be a Messiah that was going to be victorious, that was going to conquer their enemies. And so here comes Paul talking about a Messiah who had to suffer and who suffered. And he went back and pulled out scripture from Isaiah and he went over to Jeremiah and he pulled out scripture and, 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 and from Jeremiah and, and he talked about the suffering Messiah, Ze uh, Zechariah, and he talked about how the Messiah would die, how the Messiah would be raised again on the third day. He would die. This they could not conceive, not of their Messiah. So they went and they searched themselves. They studied the scriptures. The question is asked, did these Bereans have the right to do this? Did these Bereans have the right to check upon Paul? In my studying this week, I, I, I read uh, 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 quite a few commentaries that would lend itself to saying that they had no right to question Paul. This to me is telling the reading audience that the individuals who doubt the validity of their questioning Paul were individuals who wanted to keep people under their control. If they keep people under their control, don't, don't study what I'm teaching, don't study what I'm preaching, don't go back and check up on me, just take face value what I'm saying. Those are individuals who wanted to keep people under their control. Amen. I believe the Bereans had every right to go back and look at the scrolls, to look at the scripture, and to search for themselves. Notice that these Bereans respond to this teaching by examining the scripture. It doesn't say they went and asked the local rabbi. It doesn't say they went and discussed it with their friend. Or they went to one who called himself an expert on messiahship. They went to the scriptures themselves. They went to their Bible. Which was for them the only inspired document that they had. They searched the scriptures. We no doubt we're going to find somebody who will come along and validate what we think. <laughs> Because going into the scriptures means that there's some word. Mm -hmm. We're working our way through, we're working our way through the book of Genesis in our eight o'clock class, and, 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 and we're working through word upon word, looking at it in the Hebrew and, and, and searching the meaning in the original text. That's word. 
But this is what these individuals were doing. They were going to the Bible. We're going to the Bible. Many, many in what they call Christendom today don't know if teaching is correct or not. They don't know those who are teaching on radio or television if they are correct. Because we don't study. We don't go and follow up behind them. We take what they say as being valid because he got to be valid. He got 10,000 people in the audience. He, he's known worldwide. So, so he, he must be true. And we take it as face value. It is the scriptures and the scriptures alone that is the final judge of all teaching. Amen. Let me say that again. Amen, amen. It's the scriptures, the Bible, and scripture alone that is the final judge of all teaching. Mm -hmm. This principle is taught by the reformers, beginning with Martin Luther. It's what we call sola scriptoria. This is the idea that scriptures are the only authority for sinful man. Scripture gives the only remedy for sinful man. It's found in the Bible. It's found in the Word of God. And we must search the Scriptures. I said we have the ability to read. We have the ability to reason. We have the ability to understand. Search the Scriptures and find out what the Scripture says about sinful man and the remedy for sinful man. Amen. This is called the doctrine of sola scriptoria. And it means what is asserted without Scripture or proven revelation is only an opinion and doesn't need to be believed. You don't believe people's opinions. You believe what Scripture says. Amen. Do you hear me, church? Amen. You read what Scripture says. Amen. But when I come to you in their faith, we spend all our time in the Bible. That's what I want you to believe. I want you to believe the Bible. Amen. Yes, you come with your Bible. You come with your Bible open. Yes, we have Scripture on the screen. You read from your Bible. Understand what your Bible says. Amen. Don't take my opinion. Amen. Take it what the Scripture says. That's one of the major differences between Catholicism and Protestantism. Mm. Is their view of Scripture. The Roman Catholic Church even today has believed and taught for centuries that only the Pope and other Scripture specialists are reliable to interpret the Bible. Such an attitude has led the, con the Catholic Church to restrict Bible access to common people for a long time. When you look at the history of the 12th century, 13th, 14th, 15th century, you had the uh, division of laity and clergy. Only the clergy was allowed to uh, uh, integrate scripture. Laity could not, were not allowed to read scripture. Laity was the common people. They were not allowed to handle scripture. So they had to depend upon what clergy or the profession knows. Leaders of the church said, scripture said, they couldn't find out for themselves. And we see this attitude pretty much so. When you read history, Martin Luther, who we know was a Catholic priest, History tells us that he wasn't allowed to see or handle a complete copy of the Bible until he had earned a doctorate degree, until he was teaching at the University of Wittenberg. And when he finally discovered and got a copy of the whole Bible, it is said that he declared that the only treasure that he wanted was the Bible. Mm -hmm. Silver and gold they can have. The only thing that he wanted was the Bible. For most of us in our home, we may have two or three Bibles. Amen. Mm -hmm. Come on, we got the Bible on the phone. <laughs> Some of y'all looking at the Bible now. You got the Bible, got your Bible app, you got three or four Bible apps. Am I talking to anybody? You got your iPad, you got the Bible, we got the Bible. We, we, we have so much asset to the Bible. Right. I remember growing up in the living room on the coffee table. Anybody remember had a big family Bible? Bible weighed about 10 pounds. But it was the most treasured tool in the house. You better not be playing around that coffee table, Brother Matt. Y'all gonna break the table. Y'all gonna break the Bible. I knew you could break the Bible. That was my mama. That was my thing. 
and you could not play, mess around with the big family Bible. You read the Bible, you read the whole history of the family. Amen. You, you really didn't get to what the Bible said. Right. You read about Uncle Joe Bob, he died in 1926, and, and Sally Mary, Uncle Bob. I mean, you just read just pages and pages Amen. of history. Amen. We got the Bible. Amen. But yet still, we don't read and study the Bible like these Bereans. If you know anything about Catholicism, Catholicism for, for years was steeped in the Bible in Latin. I don't know if you ever attended a, 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 a Catholic church service. I've attended many. And a lot of the speaking was done in Latin. Now, I love the singing. I think, I, I, I think it's just gorgeous. You know, music to my ears. I remember one time when it was on Rock Ridge Road and uh, I played some chants from, uh, from, 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 from some of the services and some of the members looked at me like I was stone crazy, like I had lost my mind. See, I love those kind, I love that kind of music, I love that kind of chanting. Whether it's in Latin or whatever, it calms me, it puts me in a, in a frame of mind to study the Word of God, but it would just steep in tradition. They come in swinging the censers and, and smoke is going everywhere. The odor is going everywhere. And they come reciting those different sayings and life. And for the most part, the common person has no idea what's being said. Have no idea of what's being done and the meaning. And the thing is, you're not allowed on many occasions to ask what's going on. You have to accept it. This is why we take it uh, 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 as very serious for our students of the Bible to become excited when Martin Luther began to translate the Bible from the Latin Vulgate and he translated it into German and then you have people like John Wycliffe who comes along who's an Englishman who then takes the German Bible and then translates it into English where you have the King James Version. Now you got to understand King James didn't translate the Bible. The Bible was allowed to be translated while King James was on the throne. And that's why the name is put on the Bible, King James Bible, because he gave permission. But it was John Wycliffe who comes along and translates. Now, the thing about John Wycliffe, he lost his life translating the Bible. He lost his life translating the Bible. They paid with their lives translating or attempting to translate God's word. But these Bereans, these Bereans were categorized, categorized by great confidence in the word of God. You know the faith, I want us to have a confidence in the word of God. Amen. I want us to have a confidence as the word of God being God's final yes. authority. Yes. God's final authority. Amen. We must forever hold the standard that the authority of life, the authority for marriage, the authority for parenting, the authority for being single, the authority for money, the authority for life itself rests in scripture. Amen. Amen. We cannot allow ourselves to be persuaded that modern times and modern teachings that we need something else besides scriptures. Scriptures are now outdated. Scriptures Amen. now don't pertain. They're not relevant. Amen. The one book that has been the best-selling book for centuries has been the Bible. Amen. And it's still relevant. Amen. The Holy Spirit brings the relevancy of Scripture and applies it to our lives. Yes. Amen. Sadly, in our day, not many believers have this Berean spirit. According to the latest polls, Contends that fewer than 10% of evangelical Christians can be called deeply committed Bible reading Christians. Mm -hmm. According to the last George Gallup poll, he says that the majority of people who, prof who profess Christianity as their religion don't even know basic teachings and don't even act differently than those who claim they don't have a Christian experience. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is most people in the church today don't know what the Bible says. We don't know our Bibles. Why? Because we don't examine them daily or even weekly. They hear things taught. Many believe them without ever searching the scriptures. You ask the average Christian, what is God like? You know the first thing most people will tell you? The question is, what is God like? You know what, we know what the average person would say. 
What is God like? Now, I know some of y'all trying to think hard now. <laughs> some of y'all trying to get ahead of me. You're trying to think that. What would pastor say? No, no, no. No, let me try to get into my mind. What, what do you think the average person would say what God is like? Exactly right. The average person in America would say God is love. The average person, the average person who know anything about God, who know anything about church, the first thing they would say, God is love. And you know what? That's true. God is love. Isn't that what 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 say? Mm -hmm. The one who does not love does not know God. Why? For God is love. To say that God is love is the truth. But is it the whole truth? No, it's not the whole truth. Love is just only one attribute of God. But God has so many other attributes. God is holy. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is justice. God is omnipresent. He's, he has immutability. He has wrath. He's sovereign. And we can go on and on and on and on and on. And because the only thing that we know about God, God is love, when God begins to demonstrate some of his other attributes, we got to, oh, that can't be God. That can't be love. Because God is just love. Yes, he is love. But he is so much Amen. more. Amen. Amen. His attributes are his characteristics. Mm. His excellencies, as we say in Bible college. His, the qualities that make him God. We call them attributes, not because we add them to the essence of God. Rather than these attributes is what God manifests of himself, about himself. They cannot be separated from who God is. So when we say God is love, that's not the whole truth. We have to understand that God is also a God of wrath. Yes. And so when we see certain things happening, we got to understand in light of what Scripture yes. teaches, this yes. is just as, just as much God as Him being God of love. Amen. The problem is that most people believe in a God of their own inventions. Mm -hmm. They have made up a God that they are comfortable with. And we're really big on that in America. In America, we're big on God being subject to what I think. Mm -hmm. Because, see, in America, I got the right to think what I want to think, mm -hmm. how I want to think. That's my freedom. I have that right in America. So God has become subject to my own thinking. Never mind what the Bible says. Never mind the stories that we read about God in the Bible. No. Oh, that was for that time. My God is always good. My God is just so loving and he's so kind. We make up gods that are comfortable for us. And we try to find people who agree with our concepts of God. He's just a nice, gentle old man. That's the God of many, but that's not the God of God in the Bible. Is it right for us to pick up just one attribute and make God that one attribute? No. No. And when we do this, get this. When we do this, we are creating a God of our own choosing, of our own liking. And I want to let you know something. That's idolatry. That's idolatry. Let me add to your definition of what you already think about idolatry. Idolatry is believing the wrong thing about God. Believing the wrong thing about God is idolatry. Now, for many of us, when we think about the term idolatry, we think of someone uh, who got some idol, a little, a little uh, 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 statue of this, and, and maybe some smokes and incense going here, and we're bowing down to that. Idolatry is way much more than just limiting ourselves to worshiping something. Idolatry is what we think. Thinking something about God that's not true about him. It's putting God in the wrong place. It is creating another God in its fullest stage. It's creating another God beside the God of Scripture. And many Christians are guilty of this in thinking thoughts about God that's untrue. Now remember, that's what Satan tried to do and did successfully in working with Eve. Getting Eve to think the wrong thoughts about God by causing her to question what God has said. Now the enemy does the same thing with us to get us to question whether or not God really meant what he said. 
begin us to doubt what God said. And what he's doing, he's calling us to operate in idolatry. God is not only love, God is also a God of wrath. God is a God of justice. God is kind. God is good. He's all of that. So we have to understand the God of Scripture. The God of Scripture. Now, let's go back to Acts. So we have the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians believed Scripture, did they not? Amen. Mm -hmm. They believed Scripture, but what did it have to take for them to believe Scripture? I'm sorry, what? What did you say? Paul had to explain. He had to reason with them and give evidence. Now remember, we broke that word explain, reason. I mean, Paul had to really work. What did he do? How did Paul, what did Paul do with the Thessalonians? He lined up Scripture with Scripture. He would give the Old Testament example, and then he would bring the life of Jesus and place it right alongside Remember the major, the major premise, the minor premise, and then the conclusion. And even with coming to the conclusion with the major and minor premise, many of them yet did not believe. But now we go to Berea. And, and, these, and, these, and these individuals in Berea, they receive the word with eagerness. They receive the word with eagerness. The only difference is daily on Monday, they're going to go to the religious library, they're going to pick out a scroll, and they're going to search what Paul preached on yesterday. They're going to study for themselves. They're going to read. So the difference, Paul works with the Thessalonians, but with the Bereans, they themselves study the word. Now look at what the text said. Look at uh, verse number 17. Many of them therefore believe, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Now, has this not been the pattern since we've been in Europe? Mm -hmm. Many are, many are believing. You got women that are prominent women. Now, we keep running across this thing because as we have stayed in the Middle East, we have seen an attitude toward women. Have we not? That was less than noble. But when we go into Europe, we find that these women are prominent. They are highly thought of. And with these prominent women and Greek men, a great number of them, they believe. In. Many of them therefore believe. Therefore believe. As they search the scriptures, they believe. They believe what the scriptures produce. <laughs> if a person searched the scriptures daily, I'm sure that they would find the God of scripture, the Holy Spirit, and their testimony could be anchored in what the Word of God saying about Jesus Christ is true. And that's what they found. They found that what Paul had preached on the Sabbath was true. The Scriptures did say that. Paul wasn't making that up. They believed as they searched the Scripture. Look, look at that word believe in the text. They accepted full value. After searching, they believe. It was well, no, that's not what that really means. No, the scriptures proved it. Honorable women, leading women, leading individuals, they saw for themselves what the scriptures were saying. No, now it would seem like everything is going well here. So far, we haven't had no opposition. You've come to a synagogue and people are eager to hear what you got to say. They are searching the scriptures for themselves and they find the word exactly what you said. But there's always an enemy lurching. And we come across in verse 13. But here's our conjunction that's going to bring a contrast to what we have been saying since verse 10. Everything's been going pretty smoothly, right? But when the Jews of Thessalonica when the Jews from the town that Paul had just been ran out of, when they found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, 50 miles away, they came there likewise, agitating and stirring up the crowd. But when the, once again we find these words, 
as the gospel is being preached and believed, but with the Jews. Every time we see Paul preaching, <coughs> the next thing we see is but the Jews. Somehow word had kind of gotten out and reached to the Jews at Thessalonica that Paul had been very successful in Berea. All right. The fact that many Jews and Greeks believed and joined him became aggravating to these individuals. And these individuals, these Thessalonian Jews, began to make their way down to Berea to stir up some more trouble. Mm -hmm. Stir up some more trouble. Now the word agitating here is used in a literal sense, agitating. And we see it in the earthquake in chapter 4, verse 31. And also chapter 16, verse 26. They stirred up the crowd. They stirred up the crowd. They played on the crowd's emotion. They probably accused Paul again of the same crime that they accused him 50 miles in their hometown. That he was trying to uh, uh, be king. He was trying to get them to not have loyalty to Caesar. But place all their loyalty to Jesus. They stirred up the crowd. They, they, they accused Paul of not obeying Roman law. They accused him. These are troublemakers. They stirred up the crowd against them. This is the fifth city that we've read and studied so far that Paul has been in, and he had to be run out by an angry mob, stirred up by envious Jewish leaders. And then immediately, verse 14, and then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now remember, when we started on the second missionary journey, who's with Paul? We got Paul, Silas, Silas Timothy, and Luke. Our company starts off with four. Now, who did we leave in Philippi? Luke. We left Luke in Philippi. So now it's just Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Now, look who's going to stay here. And immediately the brethren sent Paul out as far as the sea. Now, what Luke is describing here, when he says as far as the sea, he's giving the, he's giving the people in Berea, those that are, are trying to catch Paul, who are angry at Paul, he's going to fake them out. He's going to give the illusion that Paul has taken a ship, but Paul really is on land. So they're going to take him as far as the sea and give the impression that he's getting ready to take a ship and sail out. He, but as they follow the ship, Paul is going to sneak back around and he's going to go on land to Athens. Athens is going to be his next stop. So that's why the text says here, and he took them as far as the sea. As far as the sea. And Silas and Timothy, they remained there. So Paul is now by himself. You got, um, uh, where's Luke? Philippi. Luke is in Philippi. Who is remaining at uh, Berea? Yeah. Silas. Silas, and, yeah. Silas and Timothy. Paul himself will now travel by land to Athens. And as we read on, and we will study in our next lesson next week, he reach Athens safely, but he's going to send instructions back to the Bereans that he wants Silas and Timothy to accompany him soon. So you get the church established, Preach the fundamentals, disciple, get through, and come on to Athens because I need your help in Athens. So Paul is going to be by himself. So now the gospel has now reached three Greek cities. The gospel has been established in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. And the church in Berea is basically studying the word of God. Now, you know the faith gets this. We're about to close. Get this. The basic instruction for the New Testament church is to study scripture. Everything else that we do is an addition. We have to study scripture. Study scripture will make you an effective witness. It doesn't begin and end here with us. You study scripture to get equipped. So you can go out in your communities 
and to either verbalize a witness or, or to engage in conversation where you witness and share the gospel that somebody else can come on board. Amen. But when you come into the church, the main, the, main, the main thing that should occupy our time should be getting into the scriptures and studying the scriptures. See what the scripture says. So, I mean, and, and, and what do we learn in Ephesians that the uh, the fourfold gifts, the pastor, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, is to do what? Is to equip who? The saints for the work of the ministry. You do the work of the ministry. I equip you to do the work of the ministry. How do I equip you to do the work of the ministry? By getting you to study the word of God and coming away with an understanding of the word of God. That's why every after every lesson I want to know what did you learn? Because there should never be a time just about when you come and you don't learn something. There should never be a time when you come to church and your learning is not stirred up. You have not been challenged mentally. I don't ever want you to go to a place, church, and you just sit there and listen to somebody entertain you or listen to what somebody gave you. You have your Bible open, and when you call out a text, you're reading it. And, uh, just be careful. Don't do like the other man did. Shout out loud. That's not true. <laughs> That's not in there. No, we don't want to do that. We don't, we don't want to do that. But, but you searching the scriptures yourself. Amen. Amen. Don't ever take anybody's word Amen. for it. Amen. Don't take, elder, don't take Brother Jake's word, none of the elders here, any visiting preacher or somebody on Tundra, don't ever take anybody's word for it. You have the ability to read and understand for yourself. Amen. Study. Get deep into the word of God. We invite you out to any of our in-depth Bible studies, our Sunday morning in-depth Bible studies. It's so exciting as we're going through the book of Genesis and yeah, I like word studies and going through all this. It's exciting what we're learning. Some things that we've never read before. We find it in Scripture. So that you can be intelligent about the things of God. Because, see, we should want you to know God. I want you to know God. I want you to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to know the God of Scripture. Amen. I want you to know what He thinks about you. Amen. I want you to know what He's already done for you. What he has promised you. Don't go off of cliches what you hear from this one or that one. Say, what does the Bible have to say? Amen? Amen. We will not be ignorant <coughs> regarding Scripture. We will not yes. be ignorant regarding who we are as believers. Yes, Lord. We want to be intelligent believers. Mm -hmm. And we can read. Mm 